Show. Our next guest is known as the greatest water activist in the world. Maude Barlow served as a senior water advisor to the UN General Assembly and was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right. She spent 40 years fighting for social and environmental justice and she chronicles that journey in her new book, Still Hopeful, Lessons from a Lifetime of Activism. Maude joins us now from live from Ottawa. Thanks for being here, Maude. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's just a pleasure to be here. Uh, a big question to, to start with, because the book's title is, um, it is entitled, uh, of course, uh, um, About let me, hopes. yes, Hopeful. exactly. But your opening line says, it has been getting harder to yeah. remain hopeful. You know, that's how you open. So why do you begin that way? <clears throat> well, not only was it that way when I was writing it, but you can imagine, I I couldn't have imagined that when the book came out, which is like today's pub, pub date, that there would be a terrible war that we would all be mm. um, so de devastated by in the world. And so the most important thing about hope is that it's, it's, it's when it's most needed is when things are tough. You know, and I go through the book and I talk about the times in my work when um, I was kind of on the, the right side of history, if you will, on the women's movement and so on. But other times when you're fighting against the, the grain, that's when you need hope. And I really want to distinguish between what I call false hope, which is everything is fine. Everything's going to be OK. You don't need to do anything. And what I call wise hope, which is you have to look the issue in the face. You have to know we have these issues and, and you still you are required to have hope, especially those of us let's be honest, living in a country as, you know, we're so grateful right now to not have bombs f falling on us and you turn the tap on and the water comes out and you put the switch on and the lights come on. We are so, so phenomenally lucky and we have a, a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And just quickly to add that I'm I did open it with saying it's getting harder to hope because I have four grandkids, uh, teenage grandkids who are real smart, and they hear a lot of messages around, and this is pre the war, this is but just about the climate crisis and the, you know, 10 years of the planet, good, good years of the planet left. And I thought we have to have a different message for that generation. It's just go home and put the blankets up or go out and party because there's nothing I can do and there's so much to be done. Mm. You have spent years advocating for water rights for all and you've written extensively about the topic. Why do you think so many of us, especially here in Canada, take water for granted? We grew up with what I call the myth of abundance in this country. We have so much water. It's in our music. It's in our art. It's in our history. Um, in fact, we were told that we have 20% of the world's water. Well, that's only true if you drain every lake and river. We have about 6.5% of the accessible water. That's the water you can use without hurting it. And therefore, we have not taken care of it. We don't haven't mapped our groundwater. We have very poor rules around extractive industries, oil and gas, mining and so on, with very poor uh, rules on, on pesticides and other chemicals. We really have taken it for granted. Now, I have to say, I think that's changing because I want this message to be about hope as well. I think we're beginning to understand as we realize that the global water crisis is, is real. Uh, 2.4 billion people don't have access to clean water and 4.2 don't, billion don't have access to um, proper sanitation. And so we in Canada are beginning to understand this is a heritage. This is a gift that we've been we've been honored to to ha have in our lives, and we are required to take care of it. And I really think we're going through a sea change in our relationship, not only to water but to nature. And I think that's one of the really hopeful signs that I see both internationally and here in Canada. Uh, you're you're the expert on this, Maude. What are the main uh, water issues? that uh, we need to be aware of right now in Canada that maybe the majority of the population isn't aware of? Well, we have uh, good laws, for instance, or better laws than we used to have for human waste, for our sewage. And, we're, and we governments, the federal, municipal, and provincial governments have come together to upgrade those. But, you know, we have no laws whatsoever for the waste from factory farms that comes into lakes. And we have... Well, lakes like Lake Winnipeg, which, uh, you know, some years is just covered with blue-green algae, um, which is the nutrient overload from these factory farms and cities and, and everything else. We have 246 major lakes that are quite ill because of this. Um, as I said a minute ago, we haven't mapped our groundwater. We really just drink it up. We extract it like crazy, which we're doing all over the world, by the way, as if there were no tomorrow. We really have to stop and say that we have some, some crises here. In fact, I wrote a book 
on uh, what, I, what I called Canada's water crisis, called, called boiling point. I think we've got to stop thinking that these, pro these problems are somewhere else. Yes, they are somewhere else. We are a we are a planet running out of water. And if you see the UN stats, the demand for water in our, in, on our planet is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. That is because we're polluting it, extracting it, damming our rivers to death, um, you know, overusing water and using it badly for flood irrigation and so on. We really have to change our relationship to water. And I, I try to uh, extract it a wee bit from the climate crisis, which of course is real because you could end every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow, mm. we would still have a global water crisis. Mm. And those of us who are lucky enough to live in a place with water, a special responsibility. So we continue to hear about issues in Indigenous communities in Canada um, having issues with water. So what has the Trudeau government done for people living in Indigenous community who haven't had strong access to water? Well, it is one of our national shames, as I know you know, um, that in many, many First Nations communities for many decades, there wasn't sufficient water, drinking water or um, sewage and uh, sanitation services. <clears throat> but I think the people of Canada have taken this very seriously. In all my years of activism, I have never seen more of a desire for reconciliation with First Nations, really deeply sorry for, for this, and a real desire for change. And I have to give the Trudeau government credit. I go after them when I'm mad at them for other things, but give them credit on this. There are 128 long-term boil water advisories that have been ended since the Trudeau government came into power in 2015. And I, I just think people don't seem to know that. There are still communities where, where there's having to truck in bottled water. So that's not acceptable. But I really do think there has been a desire and a movement in our country and by this government to change that. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, that it was so important to get the United Nations to recognize the human right to, uh, to water and sanitation, which we, which the United Nations did in 20, 2010. I was there in the, in the balcony uh, of the General Assembly. And our government at the time, the Harper government, opposed the human right to water. Uh, and it was largely because they didn't want to have this held against them uh, because of the situation in First Nations communities at that time. So we have come a long way. There's a long way to, still to come. But this reconciliation depends on, on, uh, on this and many other issues with, with uh, our First Peoples. Maud, you alluded to this earlier when you were talking about your grandchildren and your book is entitled Still Hopeful. So um, how do you hold on to hope that there is something still to be done to change the world that our kids and grandkids are going to inherit? What's the hope you hold on to? Here's the biggest fear I have, that you, feeling of hopelessness that people get and they hear about the sixth grade extinction and the acidification of the oceans and fires and so on. The feeling of hopelessness may lead you to think the situation's hopeless and that nobody's doing anything. And neither of those are true. The situation is not hopeless. There is incredible work being done on the climate uh, crisis, for instance. We have never been more ready as a human family, if you will, to deal with this crisis. We have the information, we know what we need to do, we have the technology to, to change, uh, and, and we, the political will is following, and we have to insist that it follows. And there is so much exciting being done. I, I mean, I write about, um, for instance, at the uh, COP26 uh, meeting in Glasgow last November, everybody says, oh, well, it, it failed. It didn't fail. It failed in some ways, yes, but they signed a, an agreement on coal, an agreement on methane. Incredibly important agreements uh, are coming on plastics in the ocean. This, there's 126 countries now uh, ready for a, a, a global treaty on plastics. Um, there's incredible work being done on biodiversity protection, which is incredibly important. If you, Yes, while we're stopping the increase in greenhouse gas emissions, we have to be protecting soil and water and wetlands and forests. And we have, we've been thinking these are all separate things. No, they're not. They're once one biosphere. And I really feel that there's been a movement. And what I want people to take from the book is, okay, learn what you need to learn about what the crises are, whether it's increasing racism, racist issues or whatever, or the environment. Do something. Find the good things that are being done and go for the solution. And if you feel overwhelmed, just ask yourself, what's the most appropriate next step to take and take it? Oh, that is a hopeful words indeed to end on. Maude, thank you so much for joining us today on International Women's Day. A pleasure to talk to you.